Every time I hear that bumper, I wish I would have learned an instrument. It's a bum, 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 bum. That's really good for me. Anyway, good morning. Sorry. ADD. My bad. Um, hey, how many of you like, like puzzles, right? And not like the uh, escape room type. I love those type puzzles, but like actual puzzles. Anybody? Any puzzle lovers? All right. Good stuff. We'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> I want to open up with puzzles this morning. I actually have a couple pictures I want to show you of some really cool puzzles that I think are really pretty. There is no punchline here. This is really true. Um, what you can't see here in this picture is like there's just so many intricate details that would place this picture together to make it beautiful. This uh, puzzle is called Two Birds. I know, creative, right? Um, but they, they go together. Let, let's show the next one. Actually, this is one of my favorite pictures that is a puzzle. Um, but all the vibrant colors, right, all the, the little pieces. Now, now both of these are 5,000-piece puzzles that are put together. I know. And um, they are so incredibly beautiful. Each one of these little pieces fitting together to make the grander picture that much more beautiful. Now, in my home, there's a constant tension because I've told you guys before, Jen really enjoys doing puzzles like this. And I am not the biggest fan because they make me feel, I don't know, what's the word, stupid, <laughs> right? I just feel so dumb when I'm trying to put them together. On the other hand, my very intelligent wife can look at them and has this supernatural ability to just put them together without effort. But here, here's the biggest tension in my life over puzzles. I am scared that I'm going to get to the very end of one of these things and realize that this would happen, right? <laughs> Y'all, this would break me. Absolutely break my brain and things in my house because if I spent that much time on 5,000 pieces going together and 400 and 4,000, you know what I'm saying, how many of them is? <laughs> <sighs> yeah, all right, there it is, there it is. If that was the reason we didn't finish it, I would lose my mind. All right, so we're in this series called It's a Page Turner, with the premise being that any good story as we read it, we can't just put it down. And we believe that the story that God is writing, not only here at the harbor, but in humanity, is that, that it is a page turner. And we've talked about a few things up to this week, but this week we are actually talking about characters and how every person does their part. And the reason I started with these puzzles is in the same way that those pieces, those unique pieces fit together to make this beautiful picture, I believe in God's story, all characters play a part in the grand picture, each created so uniquely and special to fit into the grander picture, into the grander story. And each piece matters to the big picture. And so I want to start with a question, and I'm going to ask a lot of questions today that you may write down and ponder after you leave here today. But the first question is this, is like, do you see yourself playing a part in this story? If you do, where do you see yourself playing a part in this story? And do, do you really believe that God would want to use you as part of his story? And in order for us to dive into those questions, we first have to start at this concept of being lost or found. Now, I want to define what I mean uh, by those two words, but, but here's what's true. Uh, each of us fit into one of two categories in this room. We are either lost or we are found. Now, let me define lost. A person who is lost has not yet accepted the free gift of eternal life that is found in Jesus. To be spiritually lost means that you are not a part of God's family. A lost person has no personal relationship with God, no forgiveness of sin, and no grounding in spiritual truth. And as we, as we look at the story in this, this series of this page turner story, here's what's dangerous for us. Some lost people can seek out a sense of spiritual safety through things like religious rituals or maybe self-fulfillment or maybe church. And, and here's what this does. It creates a comfort within all of us that um, can cause these things to well up inside of us. We can be moved by eloquent speech. We can be moved by good worship music. But apart from a genuine relationship with God through Jesus, a person can still be lost. All that can be true, and a person can still be lost. Now, I want to stop here and wrestle for a second. 
And no matter how secure you think you are in your salvation, and you should be, I think at some point in our life, we all have to wrestle with this concept. Because I wonder how many of us have created this false narrative in our brain, in our head that, that we follow Jesus because we are moved internally by his church or the things of his church, but when the rubber meets the road, Jesus really doesn't lead our life. We have not surrendered anything to his leading, maybe one hour on Sunday. And, and maybe outside of a prayer that we prayed, and I don't wanna downplay that, but outside of that, does our life look any different than it did before? I think we have, there, there has to be some tension for us in that reality. The hard truth is that being lost is, we, we can be lost and even proclaim with our lips the goodness of God, yet when our lives are not surrendered to his leading and to his molding, we are not his. We have been deceived. And I want to take the shame out of the room for us, because if this is you, you are in the right place today. I am so thankful that you are here. You are among a people who are very not perfect, me being the chief of them all. But we desire to follow him. Friends, to be lost is to be separated from God, but here's the good news. You don't have to stay there. In fact, one of our core values is that you can really come here as you are and that God wants every person to come as they are to him and to his church where you can find forgiveness and eternal life and life to the full through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So for those who will say yes and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that he was raised from the grave and surrender leadership of their life to Jesus you will find salvation, which makes us found. Friends, we receive salvation through grace by faith. In fact, I want to read Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 real quick. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that you have done. I'm going to read that again. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that you have done, so none of us can boast about it. You see, friends, salvation is more than just saying, I believe. Salvation requires surrender and repentance. And, and repentant, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry to God, but it is literally making a 180 degree turn from your old life and walking in a new direction. Forgetting the attractions of the world and all of the things of the former life and following the teaching and heart of Jesus. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 summarizes really well that, that none of us can serve two masters because you're either going to hate one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, why are we starting here? As we unpack all of the things that we're talking about in this series and all the things that we have talked about in this series, I would hate for this false narrative to play out in our head that we would think that we're really okay when we're really not. See, salvation is found in Jesus alone, and if we want to be used by him, for him, in his kingdom, in this page turner of a story, as, as one of the characters in his story, you and I, we have to come to a point of surrender in our lives to him. Which leads me to want to define what it means to be found. Being found means that we have been delivered by God's grace from sin and its consequences of eternal punishment and being raised to the newness of life in Christ Jesus. For those who are saved, what we're saying is that there was this moment in our life where we were captivated by the stunning love that God has for us. Sinners like you and I looked to Christ and said, you take control, Jesus. The intention to fully surrender and have deep dependence on God. Do we stumble? Sure. Do we fall? You bet. But if Christ lives in us, even in those moments, our heart is caused to move toward him and not away from him. So as we talk about characters, we have to start here because I believe we fall into one of two categories. We are either lost or we are found. And the most important question I'm going to ask today is where are you? Which one are you? A big way to know where you are is to ask yourself the question, building off of what we talked about in the past weeks, who is the hero of your story? 
Have you allowed Jesus to play the hero in your life, to be that character? Or would you recognize the grace of God telling you today that you have tried to fill those shoes? Because here's what's true, friends. You can't fill those shoes. You cannot do only what Jesus can do in your life. And at the end of the story, when all of this is done, the Bible says that all of creation will have full understanding of who the hero really is. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, 9 through 11 says it like this. Therefore, God elevated him, Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Everything would bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The question for us in the grand story is, when will we choose to surrender? All of us will bow. All of us will declare that he is Lord. I just pray that none of us wait until that day. Because if we do, it's too late. If you are lost today, you have a choice today. Here is why Jesus came. He came so that he came to save lost people whose sin has caused death. He came to seek and save the hearts of the lost. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and in him we find life. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us deserve the penalty of death, eternal separation between us and God. And what happens is our sin has created a chasm between us and God that we cannot bridge, and oh, we try. This is what's true for all mankind, but I say this over and over and over again. Glory to God, he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, right? God sent his son Jesus to be human, to, to live a perfect life, a sinless life. Innocently, Jesus would die on a cross to pay death's penalty for our sin, your sin, my sin. He was buried in a grave. Three days later, he raises and literally walks out of the grave, conquering sin and death so that he could offer you an invitation and me an invitation to follow him. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you openly declare Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the good news. And God's heart is that all of us hearing my voice, whether here or online, would know that salvation is found in Jesus and that we can do so by this. Confess, that God, confess to God that you are a sinner in need of saving. Believe in your heart that Christ really did die for you. That God raised him from the dead and surrender leadership. We say that a lot here. Surrender leadership of your life to Jesus. You will be saved. You will be found. And you can do that right here where we sit today in the quietness of your heart. If you are lost today, my only challenge to you is this. Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. Speaking from example, I have been on the side of lost and I have been on the side of found and I will choose Jesus a million times over. The good news is that for those who are in Christ, we have been given a new life and a particular part to play as a character in his story. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you are a follower of Jesus, he desires that you play a role in his story. And that role, friends, matters. And that's what I want to build a case for today. You living out being the person that God has asked you to be really matters. And it's going to be living by faith that will fuel that. And so if you have a Bible, Hebrews chapter 11 is where we're going to be. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it's one of my favorite passages of scripture because we see this legacy of people who lived by faith and did great things for God. Who did great things for the kingdom of God out of great faith. The whole chapter of the Bible, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, is looking back on what it looks like to play your role well. Not perfect, but well. And here, here's what I love, right? Because over and over again in Hebrews chapter 11, when it refers to a person, it says that they did things by faith. In fact, it starts like this. It was by faith that, and then he, he tells the story. And the author of Hebrews doesn't want us to be left not understanding what faith really is. And so he starts the chapter off by saying this, chapter 11, verse 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for, and it's the evidence of things that we cannot see. Friends, can I clear the air for us? Faith is not easy. 
And if anyone has ever led you to believe or told you that faith is easy, they have misled you. Faith is hard. You want to know why it's hard? Because we're hoping and trusting in things that we cannot see. And God in his great plan and love for us will let us see the things that we are hoping for. Faith is hard. And it's good. It's the reality of what we hope for and the evidence of things we cannot see. And so I want to ask another question this morning. What do you hope for when it comes to the kingdom of God? Do you hope anything? Or maybe the question is, what is your hope in your life, in your faith journey? Have you ever considered that question? Are you hoping for things eternal? Would you have faith in the Lord that he would want to do great things in you and then through you? Have you ever considered that question? And so in Hebrews chapter 11, and we're not going to read this passage word for word, but you can read story after story after story of people who by faith chose to play the role that God gave them, and it celebrates that. And here's a few of the characters you'll read about. Noah, right? All of us know who Noah is probably. Here's what we know about Noah. He built a large boat because God told him to. Right? He told him exactly how to do it. We call it an ark. He did what God asked him to do when God told him of the crazy things that were going to happen that no one had ever heard before. And what happens? We know the story. He builds this ark. He is mocked. He is jeered at. People told him he was crazy and stupid. And I'm like, dude, he's building a boat. Leave him alone. <laughs> like, if you don't believe it, what happens? It starts raining. For 40 days, the floodwaters come. And the boat begins to rise and everything else is killed. The only thing that makes it are the things that are on that boat. God supernaturally bought animals two by two, right? Some of you hunters need to start praying a lot bigger, okay? <laughs> He's done it before. He can do it again. <laughs> and then check this out, okay? He played a part in God's story. We get to the end of Genesis chapter 9 and here's what it says about Noah. He lived 950 years and then he died. And the story continues. Sarah. Sarah was a woman who was barren and too old to have children, but was promised by God that he would give her and her husband Abraham a son. And imperfectly, you can go read the story, man. She messes up along the way and he messes up along the way, but imperfectly she believed that God would keep his promise. And God did. And the Bible says that from that, descendants were so vast that it was compared to the number of stars in the sky or sand on a beach. Have you ever tried to count those? There's a lot. Too many to count. And then Genesis chapter 3, we read that Sarah lived 127 years, and then she dies. And the story continues. Joseph. Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons. His father, out of love for him, gave him this coat. You may have heard it as a coat of many colors. He opens his mouth a little bit too much and talks about the dreams he's having, about how much his dad loves him. His brothers get jealous, and they sell him into slavery. He was taken to Egypt, and he was eventually promoted in slavery to being the steward of Potiphar, who was one of Pharaoh's high-ranking officials. Potiphar's wife tries to unsuccessfully seduce him, and after this false accusation that was leveled against him, Joseph was put in prison. But even in prison, we see in his story that he remains faithful. And due to his ability that was given to him by God to interpret dreams that Pharaoh was having, Pharaoh made him the governor over Egypt who would eventually wisely ration the country's produce in preparation from a famine that God told him was coming. And, and during this famine, who enters the picture? Joseph's family, Jacob's sons, his brothers. They come, they don't recognize him, they are begging for food, and after some time, he identifies himself with great joy, not to show them up, but he's in a position where he can love them, like Jesus loves us. And Joseph invites his father and brothers to come and settle in Egypt, and it was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently to the people of Israel that you will leave Egypt one day. You will no longer be slaves one day. I'm so confident of it that I want you to take my dead bones with you when you march out of this place. And then it says that Joseph lived to be 110 years old, and then he, what, died. Yet, 
God's page turner of a story continues. And then there's Moses. Most of us know the name of Moses, either through the Bible or Disney. It's okay, either one. <laughs> the Bible says it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's wife. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it would be better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own all the treasures in Egypt. Whoo! He thought it would be better to suffer for Jesus than to have everything. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. And it was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover, to put blood over their doorposts so that the angel of death wouldn't kill their firstborn sons. And it was by faith that the people of Israel, under Moses' direction, would walk through the Red Sea as though they were walking on dry ground. And then when the Egyptians tried to follow, the water engulfs them and kills them. Now, here's what's true about Moses. When God comes to him and tells him to do this, you know what he didn't have? Superhuman ability. He was an average Joe like you and me. However, he was a person that said yes to playing the, God, the role that God had given him. Every person does their part. And if you pick up in Hebrews 11, verse 32, here's what it says. How much more do I need to say? I, it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah. David, Samuel, and all the prophets. It was by faith that these people overthrew kingdoms and ruled with justice and received what God had promised them. They got to see their faith. It says they shut the mouths of lions and quenched flames of fire and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned into strength. If you have a pen or something, underline that. Oh, that we would believe that our weakness could be our greatest strength to Jesus. They became strong in battle, and they put whole armies to flight. Each of these mentioned bought into the role and had the faith to play the role that God had given them in his page turner of a story. And out of that, they were given supernatural strength to be those men and women, the same supernatural strength that I believe God wants to give us to play our role. Friends, none of these people listed or even not listed were perfect. But they bought into the fact that the God of the universe wanted to use them. And they had faith believing that God is who he says he is and will do what he said he will do. And they imperfectly opened their hands and hearts and said, God, I will go. God, I will, I will do that. God, what do you want from me next? Where do I go now? I will leave this behind and follow you. What role do you want me to play? And thousands came after them. Let me, let me not underplay that. Hundreds of thousands. In this page turner of a story, millions made the choice to surrender to Jesus because of people's faithfulness. Sure, God can do it. But he invites you and I to play a part in his story. Every person does their part. You want to know why it's important for us to read through here and, and remember these things. Like you and I sitting here, this is important for us to be aware of for one reason. This is our spiritual lineage, friends. It was from their faithfulness and the faithfulness of those after that somewhere along your journey, somebody told you about Jesus. Or maybe you were in a venue and the, the, the good news, the gospel was proclaimed from a stage and, and your heart was awakened to God's love for you, or maybe, just maybe, in your deepest, darkest moment, somebody who loves Jesus, loved you like Jesus, and it compelled you to choose that same God. Every person does their part. Friends, the possibilities are endless when a person surrenders all to Jesus and has an open heart and tells God, what role do you want me to play in this story, God, because I believe it's going to be an important one. And it would be easy for us to think, Weston, I will never be like Moses, right? If, if Hebrews 11 part 2 was written one day, they wouldn't put me in Hebrews chapter 11. I can never be one of those famous eloquent teachers or those guys that can sing really well. And to that, you know what I say? Good. 
The longer I follow Jesus, the less I want to be that guy. In fact, I want to be like a guy named Edward Kimball. It's a man that I know of. I want to tell you his story. Now, I could rest assured that most of us in here have never heard the name Edward Kimball. But in 1854, Kimball was a volunteer who not only prayed for the hyper little boys in the class that he had on Sunday mornings, but he sought to share Jesus with each of them personally. He decided that he would be intentional with every last one of them. Surely there were moments where he thought about throwing in the towel, because if you've ever done this, you know how much like hurting cats it is, right? Some of my children's people give me a what, what? <laughs> but he took his role to heart, right? Like many of you do here, and like many of you live out in your daily lives. One young man in particular didn't seem to understand salvation through Jesus, um, this, this salvation story that Kimball was was sharing, and so Kimball went above and beyond. He was, he, this young boy was working at his dad's shoe, shoe store, and he was a stock boy, and Kimball asked his dad if he could come and just be there and help him work, and then along the way, he would just continue to tell him these stories and tell him how much God loved him and continue to tell him of this Savior that died for him. And somewhere along that journey, a young man by the name of Dwight L. Moody came to know Jesus as Savior. And if you know the story of Dwight L. Moody, in his lifetime, he was able, by God's power and presence in his life, to reach two continents with the story of Jesus. Thousands would come to know Jesus because of the faithfulness of Dwight L. Moody. But that's not where the story ends. Actually, it's where it begins because it was under Moody that another man's heart was touched for God, a guy named Wilbur Chapman. Chapman began an evangelistic crusade to preach to thousands over his lifetime. One day, a professional ball player came to one of Chapman's meetings. This talented ball player was named Billy Sunday. And because of Chapman playing a role in God's story, playing his role in God's story, Billy Sunday becomes a Christian. And this professional baseball player quits playing baseball and joins Chapman on his um, journey to tell people others about Jesus. And at some point in the journey, Chapman accepts a pastorate at a large church. And so Billy takes over what Chapman was doing on the road. And he begins to host these crusades where they invite people to come and to hear about Jesus. And if you know anything about Billy Sunday, you will know that he's considered one of the most influential American evangelists during the first two decades of the 20th century. Again, Thousands came to know Jesus because he played the role that God gave him. But the story doesn't stop there. In fact, it only gets better. Because it was through Billy Sunday that another young man came to know Jesus whose name was Mordecai Ham. He was a scholarly, dignified gentleman who had a way of attracting people. And God used that to attract people when he came into town. He would put a big tent up. You may have heard of tent revivals. And he would invite people to come and hear about Jesus. And man, did they come. And he goes into Charlotte, North Carolina one weekend, which is the home of this sandy-haired, lanky young man that was then in high school who vowed to his friends that he would never go to that tent and hear that crazy man talk. But his buddy said, well, we're actually going to go to try to tear the tent down. Would you come and watch? And he said, ha, yes, Right? He, sh he shows up, he hears the message, and what he didn't tell people was that he was intrigued by what he heard. So returning another night that his friends didn't know of, he sat and listened to Mordecai Ham share the good news of Jesus. And that night, Billy Graham came to know Jesus. And through Billy Graham's ministry, many of us know him. He went to be with Jesus not too long ago. It's estimated that 200 million people have been reached with the good news. And 3.2 million people chose to follow Jesus after one of his messages. You want to tell me your role doesn't matter? And I don't want you to miss my point because here's what I'm not screaming. I don't want you to hear me say, well, we need to be, be like Billy Graham. None of us can be like Billy Graham. Because none of us can be like Weston and none of us can be like you. You were created unique to fit into this puzzle. But if I could be like anybody, you know who I want to be like? Edward Kimball. This faithful, not so loud dude 
who cared enough to just say, yes, God, I will take that rambunctious role, those, those boys, and I will convince them how much you love them. And I won't give up until every one of them know it. And I don't know what God would ask of you, but here's what I do know. In the same way that he compelled Mr. Kimball to do that, I know he's compelling you to do it too. In the church and out of it. Would you believe so bigly, bigly's not a word, but largely, whatever. <laughs> would you believe so big that God would want to use you where you are? Friends, every role in the kingdom of God is a big role and it matters because eternity is at stake. So I got four questions for us to ponder as we end. The first is this, and I've said it over and over again, but would you really believe that God would want to use you in his story, friends? Like, really use you. If you would be faithful enough to just open up your hands and heart and say, just tell me what you want, God. I know that he does, because if you read through chapter 11 of Hebrews, you, it tells all these stories, and then at chapter 12 it says, therefore, verse 1, therefore, because all that stuff is true, since we're surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, you and I, present tense, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. In view of all of those stories, let us throw off every weight, especially the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, who champions, the, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because the joy awaiting him. And I love this about Jesus because he doesn't just tell, stuff, tell us to do stuff that he didn't do. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, degrading its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Would you really believe that God wants to use you in his story? Number two, are you content with the role that you get to play? That's a big question, and it's one I struggle with sometimes. There's things that as followers of Christ we are asked to do, all of us. We're commissioned to do by God. We are to follow Jesus and depend on the Father to do so. We are to love others selflessly. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We are to tell others about our great faith and invite them to follow Jesus. And we are to help them grow in Christ Jesus. If you, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is what you signed up for. And then there are these things that God designed you for, right? Like this unique thing. We call it a wheelhouse here at the harbor. It's where our passions and our gifts intersect. Each of us, God has wired us so uniquely to fit into the puzzle, and he wants to use our passions and gifts in such a special way. The question is, would we let him? It's not about wishing that we were somebody else with somebody else's gifts. The puzzle needs your peace, friends. Take this to the bank, okay? I was thinking about this this week. I am more convinced than ever that the root of my joy in Jesus is found when I am content where God wants me to be. The root of my joy that's found in Jesus is found in contentment. It's about being where he's asked us to be. And if we get so bogged down on the things that we don't have and the places we don't get, we will never see the gift that God has given us in front of us. We will never see the power in which we get to operate. Are you content to play the role that you get to play, that he wants you to play? And then the last question is this, and it's an even harder one. Is there anything within you that desires the lead role? I was talking to a friend this week at Summer Moon, and she was telling me about a, a paper that her son wrote about the solar system. And I asked her if I could use it today. But uh, it was a paper that talked about how scientists for a long time believed that the earth was the center of the solar system and everything revolved around it. And it wasn't until that they were able to get um, a greater perspective that they realized that the earth was just a part of the solar system rotating around something much greater. And, and friends, I wonder if many of us have the belief that everything revolves around us. Or would we allow God to dewire this belief 
and give us greater perspective that maybe our life could revolve around him. What would you be willing to do to kill the desire to play the hero in your life? And would you allow Jesus to play the hero? Listen, some of us, we've been trying to play this role for far too long, and it has just gotten us deeper and deeper into despair and trouble. And so would you just let Jesus play the hero? Release this belief that you have to save yourself. Release the belief that you have to fix yourself. And let Jesus do only what he can do. And then ask him to give you great vision for the role that you are supposed to play in his story. Because as we end, here's what I know will happen if you do that. When we are content to play the role that God has for us, number one, God will give us vision for what that looks like. Number two, we will feel present with him. And friends, that is the greatest gift of our salvation is the presence of Jesus in our life. And number three, we will experience life abundant. So as we end, I can't help but think that God is stirring some stuff in us and that's good because that just reminds us how much God loves us. So I wanna tell you about two opportunities. The first is this, is many of you know we have a prayer team that resides up here after our services and if you're a part of that, I'd love to invite you. I know this is impromptu to just go ahead and come up here and prepare, but maybe today, if God has stirred something in you, you would go and ask one of those members of the prayer team to pray for you. They would love to do that. If today was the day of salvation for you, if today was the day that you said, Jesus, I can't do it anymore, I surrender all to you, would you tell one of our prayer team members? They would love to pray that God would give you vision and excitement for what he wants you to do. But if you wanna, if you wanna rest a little bit deeper into prayer, I wanna invite you to a special night called Night of Prayer. This Wednesday, September 7th, we're gonna have food for you starting at 6.15. And then at 6.45 until around eight o'clock, we're gonna have prayer and worship. And we're gonna sit in the presence of God. And here's what I know. Every time we've done this, God works supernaturally. He speaks to us supernaturally. And maybe it would be that you need to bring some of the stuff that he's stirring in your heart tonight of prayer so that we can just sit with God and go, what do you want? What do you want? Because I believe that all of us, just like each one of those pieces of the puzzle, play a great part in the beautiful picture that we get to see through faith in Jesus. So friends, can we stand and can I pray for us? And then we're gonna be done. And I would ask that we would ponder, what role would God have me play in his story? All right. Well, Father, it is a great joy that we get to read your word, Hebrews chapter 11, and we get to read and recount these stories of people who out of great faith chose to play the role that you gave them. And we sit on their backs here today because of the salvation of Jesus, but because there were faithful people who chose to play the role that you gave them in our life. And there are people in our life who you're asking us to play the same role. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you give us vision for what that would look like? Would you help us to believe that we don't have to be anything greater than what you're asking us to be? Maybe some of us would, would rest in your presence and, and receive the restoration that we need so that we can eventually go out and be your hands and feet. Whatever it is, God, I just pray that we would move and say yes to you. And Father, as we leave this place, let us not be well, help us to be content. Help us to live out of a heart that is content in being where you have us and help us to see through lenses that think eternally. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, you are loved by God. Go live out that vision. Amen? Amen.